Alexander, in response, is said to have sent back letters saying, in effect, basically, why should I negotiate with you for something which already belongs to me? Patipur! Kushiata Musaraka. Patipur! Alejandro's Prostalion Graffi. Ine yata ta kreme ta katin korano tu pasan. What was at stake at Galgamela was the entire Persian Empire. If Alexander could bring Darius to battle and defeat him, he would lay honest claim to rule of the Persian Empire. Kautitaja Ijahaka Avarana. Gagamela Kruciata Muzarka. Gagamela. Adishtai Adahan Avaran Agagamela. Darius had increased his army, drawing men from across the empire. As the Persian army began to move into place, Greek scouts reported to Alexander that Darius's army was larger than anything they had ever seen before. The estimates are actually all over the field, but uh, we, we suspected he probably had around 200 to 250,000 men on the field, which would have been about five times the size of Alexander's force. The Macedonian army, we, we think we have fairly certain figures for. We're talking about 40,000 infantry of all types and about 7,000 cavalry. Alexander's second in command was Parmenio, a seasoned cavalry commander. Parmenio was uh, one of Philip's most trusted generals. He was also of the old school. He was one of the only generals that regularly stood up and argued with Alexander. And in some cases, Alexander would, would ask Parmenio for, uh, for advice, knowing that he would get a conservative answer from Parmenio. And therefore, he would understand how a conservative commander would view a certain situation. And oftentimes, he would then use that information to develop a plan that would counter a conservative reaction. With the Macedonians outnumbered five to one, the old general was worried. He got a guy. He wanted to attack while the enemy slept. Tigar, a pelicanai planastai ke poye ke ke farme ora derian. Egoman an Alexandros, egoman an es. Kaigo. E permenian en. I look ego permenian. E klepto teniken. Tu pame tu porri. He was arrogant and brash, but he had to be to lead in that kind of an environment. Darius had expected an attack in the dark and left his army standing on alert for the entire night. It was not a cohesive force, but a series of armed groups levied from the governors or satraps from every corner of the empire. The king would go to the satrap and say, your tax this year is a thousand men. And he might have a huge variety of these from different places. He fought with Ethiopians. He fought with Bactrians, who would be Afghanistan today. They were all over the place, and they may speak different languages, have different cultures, have different weapons. Most Persian warriors wore no armor and no helmet. Each carried a spear two and a half meters long and a shield made of wicker. But what the Persian army lacked in armor and weapons they made up for in numbers. Their strategy was to use overwhelming force. You think of the Persians, they're not a bunch of yahoos. The tactics that they're using have been effective for hundreds of years. The Persians have a huge empire. It's been good enough. Against this enormous army, Alexander had one advantage. Hot! The Macedonian phalanx. Captain Dale Dye, a retired U.S. Marine officer and military historian has studied the Macedonian approach to warfare. The Macedonian phalanx, probably the most potent weapon of war in the ancient world. The phalanx, blocks of individuals, 256 men arranged 16 across 
by 16 deep. Once you were in the formation and going forward, you really had no choice as to whether you were gonna go backwards or not. You were definitely going forward with this massive wall of human muscle and spear points, and that's what made it so overwhelming. In the front rank were the most veteran fighters, the fighters who had proved their courage, their bravery on the battlefield, who could be relied on to go forth and contact the enemy. He carried a small shield the shield was suspended by a strap from his neck so that it would help support the weight. More importantly, that would allow his left hand, his shield hand, to be free. Not grasping the shield, but free so that he could reach over and grasp his primary weapon. And his primary weapon was the sarissa. Now, we believe sarissas were somewhere between 16 and 18 feet long. Up to this point, the principal combatants were carrying seven to eight foot spears. Philip gave the infantry longer spears. His phalanx now had greater standoff than the average uh, Greek or Persians would have. Think this way, 256 sarissas, 16 to 18 feet long, in front of the phalanx, a bristling hedgehog of spear points that the enemy could not get under, around, or over. How intimidating was the phalanx? Let's take a look at what a Persian trooper might have seen. Phalanx, battle positions, move! Ah! At dawn on the morning of October the 1st, 331 BC, the phalanx began to form on the battlefield at Gaugamela. Arrayed to the right of the phalanx was generally a unit of heavy infantry, what the Greeks called hoplites. They carried a large shield, unlike the smaller phalangite shield. The shield was known as a hoplon. In combat, it could be used to bludgeon the enemy, back him up, knock him over, which would provide time for the hoplite to use his primary sidearm, a sword. In many cases, a leaf blade sword like this, a short sword, unlike the medieval cleavers that you see. This was a short sword designed to do butchery in tight. The hoplite could hide his weapon so that you had no idea where he was going to strike. He didn't advertise what he was going to do with the weapon. He could come in low, or he could come in high. He was not in the mood to sword fight with an enemy. He was in the mood to use his large hoplon shield to push that enemy back, to keep progressing, to never lose his own momentum, so that if the enemy should stumble or get his feet tangled up, he was on the ground. And when he was on the ground, the hoplite took care of him. With the armies in place, the battle lines at Galgamela had been drawn. Darius was apparently planning Galgamela to be the final battle. The size of the Persian army surpassed any before seen in the ancient world, perhaps as large as a quarter of a million men. The army of Alexander consisted of just 45,000. The stakes were high. For Darius, he knew that if he lost this battle, he would probably lose his empire. For Alexander, the stakes were high too. He had staked everything on defeating Darius and becoming the king of, of Persia. Alexander was risking everything on this one battle. If he won, all the riches of the Persian Empire would be his. If he lost, 45,000 men would be slaughtered and it would open the way for a Persian invasion of Greece. Quite simply, the outcome of the battle would determine the future of two continents.
close to the Persian village of Gaugamela, Alexander the Great and his army of 45,000 Macedonians faced King Darius and a Persian force nearly five times larger. Darius's army stretched in an unbroken line four kilometers long. The odds were overwhelming, but Alexander had trained his men for just such an encounter. Darius had laid out his battle line in a way that was a tremendous challenge for anybody. It was two and a half miles long, and there were fairways, killing zones, laid out for scythe chariots. Chariots with iron blades on the front and on the sides. The Macedonians, no matter how far they stretched out their line, they still were going to be overlapped by about a half a mile. So Alexander was walking into a double envelopment where Darius was going to send his cavalry from each side while he was sending these scythe chariots at Alexander. Well, if you're Alexander, what are you going to do against something like that? 